Hello, and welcome to this afternoon's author reading and conversation with Alex Olin. I'm Merck Sickinger, Programming Chair for the Alice Munro Festival of the Short Story. The Alice Munro Festival of the Short Story, now in its 19th year, celebrates short stories and Canadian writers in the landscape that inspired Alice Munro. You can find out more about the festival by following us on Facebook or checking out our website, alicemunrofestival.ca. I would like to start this afternoon's event by acknowledging that here in County, the land where I'm coming to you from is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples. We recognize the First Peoples' continued stewardship of the land and water and that this territory was subject to the dish with one spoon wampum, under which multiple nations agreed to care for the land and resources by the Great Lakes in peace. We also acknowledge our roles as treaty people committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation, gratitude, and respect with all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Um, this is our final event of this year's festival, and um, hopefully this isn't your first event, but if it is, welcome. Our author this afternoon is Alex Olin. She is the author of five books, including the novels Inside and Dual Citizens, which were both finalists for the Scotiabank Giller Prize and the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Tin House, Best American Short Stories, and many other public publications. Born and raised in Montreal, she lives in Vancouver, where she chairs the creative writing program at the University of British Columbia. And if all of that wasn't enough, she has a new collection of short stories, We Want What We Want, that will be available on Ju July 27th. Welcome, Alex. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Yes. Okay. Here we go. Before we dive into your wonderful new short story collection, We Want What We Want, I was hoping we could take a step back and take a broader view and talk about short stories in general. Um, it seems like the right thing to do at a festival named after Alice Munro and um, that has short story right in its name. So in the acknowledgments of your new book, you, you begin by saying, short stories are my first and greatest love as a writer, and I'm forever grateful to everyone who reads, writes, and publishes them. Tell me what it is about short stories that you love as a writer. Yeah, I really came to writing through the short story form. For me, it's my favorite thing to to write and uh, and to read. I I really um, I really am drawn to. I think the the combination of precision and elasticity of the short story form, which I mean precision in the sense that a short story um, can be like a poem. It's something that you read uh, potentially in one sitting. And so it has to be very precise and perfectly executed. At the same time, it is elastic because it's also a space for experimentation and a place where you can really try something radical and perhaps pull it off in a way that would be harder to sustain over the course of a long novel. So when I think about writers who've been really, um, ex you know, inspiring to me, um, many of them are short story writers, including Alice Munro herself, who I think is like one of the most quietly radical writers that we have. If you think about what she does with these short stories, she creates a space for the characters to live in, but then she'll turn it upside down. She'll take one moment in time and run it alongside another moment in time and then intertwine them. She'll jump around. She will show you something uh, incredibly kind of quiet and domestic. And then at the next moment, reveal something that is very violent and dark. And she does all that within this incredibly, you know, economic um, space. So when I think about what really turned me on to writing, definitely Alice Munro's work was a huge influence. People like uh, Mavis Gallant, uh, she was also a huge influence for me starting out. And now I see a lot of excitement 
exciting work happening with the short story forum. A lot of different voices. It's a very like international forum. Uh, it's a very inventive forum. So I think of people like, for example, there's a, an American writer named Brian Washington. He has a short story collection called Lot that I think is just um, fantastic, like linked short story collection set in the Houston, Texas area. And what he's doing is uh, phenomenal. So I just, to me, it's like endlessly renewing itself as a forum. And people are always like picking it up, trying something new and um, discovering new ways to, to play with it. I read Lot last summer and I loved yeah. it. So uh, good, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's, his is a great voice. And I can't remember the name of the novel that came out this year. The, um, it's called it's, Memorial. It's also yeah, very yeah, good. Yeah, <laughs> which is great too. I was just going to say, I can't remember the name of the book, but I, I really enjoyed it as well. Yeah. Um, Emma Donahue said at one of the events yesterday that all writers should be forced to write short stories as part of their training. In your role as chair of the creative writing program at UBC, how much emphasis is put on short stories as part of the development of writers within the program? Oh, you know, that's so interesting. I um, uh, hugely respect Emma Donahue, but it's, I want to very gently like push back against that statement in the sense that people often talk about the short story as a training ground for other writing. Like you learn the short story first and then you graduate to something else. And I don't really like that because I think it implies that the short story form is like somehow junior or preliminary, which it is not. It is its own form that is um, very complicated and um, challenging to master. That said, uh, it certainly can be um, easier for writers to try to <clears throat> uh, start off writing a short story than, uh, than it would be just to like sit down one day having never written anything at all and, and write a novel in the same way that you would, uh, if you were training to be a runner, you would probably start with something shorter and not like just get up one day and run a marathon. So that's certainly true. At UBC, we do uh, teach a range of approaches to fiction, but my classes are 100% short story. I'm a short story evangelist. I love to teach them. I love to uh, read them with writers. I love to see the way that students take on the form and make it their own. So I definitely uh, do teach it a lot and find it very uh, joyous to come together with students to talk about what makes short stories work. Yeah, I, I, I had a I had a follow up question prepared about that exact bias because we hear it all the time from writers at the festival. This this notion that you be short stories are are training wheels, are beginner wheels, and that for writers, the evolution for any writer is to graduate to the novel. And I think it's something that Alice Monroe struggled with um, her whole writing career as well. Is when are you going to write the novel? Um, and we hear from writers all the time that even if they love short stories, that publishers claim that readers don't want short stories and there's a hesit hesitancy to publish them. So do you find that too, that despite your love of short stories, there's, there's almost an industry bias against them sometimes? That's definitely something that you hear um, discussed a lot and talked about a lot. It's definitely true that short story collections don't sell as well as novels, although I also wonder if, like a lot of other marketing uh, situations that if it isn't a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know what I mean? Like a writer um, who has a lot of uh, weight put behind them by a publisher is going to sell more copies of, you know, a given book. So if publishers don't put their weight behind short story collections, how are they ever going to sell? It does seem to me that in our current kind of short attention age or age when there's a lot of things competing for our attention in an age when many of us read digitally, I actually think the short story form is very like, well suited for that. And I think there's a lot of really effective digital publishing being done of the short story. Um, the New Yorker just, you know, that's a big example, but they don't just publish it online. They also have a podcast. They have writers reading their work and talking about their work so that people can read the short story on their phone or they can listen to it while they're walking the dog. And there are a lot of other smaller literary journals um, like, um, I don't know, Joyland or Cosmonauts Avenue that are also doing great work in promoting the short story. So it may be that um, it's, 
easier for people to come to the story on an individual one by one uh, basis than it is on on the collection. I'm not sure, but I really um, I really think that just because publishers say something is true doesn't mean that it's necessarily true. It just means that uh, they haven't been disproven yet. And yeah, it's it's self fulfilling, right? <laughs> They're making it so. Um, so the, uh, those were my questions, you know, about uh, short stories in general. And now I'd like to shift gears and, and really, you know, dive into the stories of we want what we want, um, which is what we're here mostly to discuss today. So I don't know if you want to start with a reading um, from one of the stories and then and then we can have some discussion in. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. So I thought I would just read um, very briefly uh, from the beginning of one of the stories in the book. Uh, the story is called uh, FMK, and uh, I was looking at it just briefly before um, before coming to this Zoom and realizing it, it does maybe contain a slightly adult situation and content, so I don't know if anybody has young children with them, but just wanted to give you a, a little heads up. So uh, this is FMK. We'd been to this funeral home twice before. At least, I think we had. I guess it sounds heartless, but they blend together with their signs calligraphied with the family name, the floral arrangements and folded programs, the standard chairs in the standard rows. Even the silence feels uniform in these places. They must all use the same soundproofing. I followed Kat inside, making intermittent eye contact with strangers and smiling a closed-mouthed half-smile, the facial expression that is also uniform at funerals. Mr. Braverman's service was standing room only, and we took positions at the back. It was nice to see an overflowing crowd. I hate the funerals with just a few souls huddled in their misery like animals outside in a storm. Here I saw little kids dressed up and fidgeting in the second row. Some people don't like children at a service, but I think it helps everyone to remember the promise of youth in the world. I don't know what it's like for the kids. An elderly woman in pearls entered the room, and from the way heads swiveled in her direction, I took her to be Mrs. Braverman. Her clothes, though elegant, looked at least a size too large, bought for the woman she used to be. Her eyes were hooded and vacant until they lit on Kat, who stepped forward to meet her. They hugged for a long time. Thank you for being here, Mrs. Braverman said as they let go, and Kat said, of course. The widow's eyes grazed across me, and Kat added, this is my friend Trish. Mrs. Braverman bobbed her head and moved on. I didn't bother to tell her I was sorry for her loss. My presence didn't matter, and neither would my words. We came for the hug between her and Kat who had located Mr. Braverman's most accommodating vein and rubbed his necrotic feet and emptied his catheter bag and washed his wasted body and left the imprint of Mrs. Braverman's lipstick kiss on his cheek when he died. Cat was here for Mrs. Braverman. I was here for Cat. The first time I met Cat, she was out with her work friends at the Red Sombrero and they were all drunk off their asses. I was with my work friends too, but we were admin assistants, too poverty stricken and subservient to cause much of a ruckus. If one of us spilled beer on the table, another would rush to wipe it up. I'd been at the job a month and wanted desperately to be promoted, provided I didn't but die of boredom first. I'd spent my twenties playing in a band with nothing to show for it. Now I wanted a steady income and benefits. I wanted to buy a condo and adopt a dog. Sleeping in a real bed night after night still seemed like a luxury to me, a dangling prize that could be snatched away at any time. Nonetheless, I couldn't help but turn my head when I saw those women whooping and hollering on the other side of the bar. They were playing the most reckless and violent game of darts I'd ever seen. Darts bombed the wall below the target. One woman took a hit to the thigh, howling with pain as the others only shrieked with laughter. When our waitress, with whom I'd be, been low-key flirting, brought our second round, I tried to offer her some sympathy. Rough customers over there. She glanced over, shrugged. Every Friday, they tear the place up. Can't say anything to them, though. Why not? Because of where they work. She jerked her head to the side. Up the street. You know they have to cut loose. I didn't know what she meant. This wasn't my neighborhood. 
But Molly, who sat in the cubicle three down from mine, was nodding vigorously. Makes sense, she said. What makes sense, I said. Molly dropped her voice. Hospice. A dart sailed across the bar and landed near my shoe. I picked it up and carried it over. You have a license for this thing, I said. The nurses were busy yelling at each other about what shitty throwers they were, and not one of them acknowledged me or took the dart back. They lingered there like an idiot. Finally, one of them turned and said, oh shit, sorry, and grabbed it, but I held on. She was wearing dark blue scrubs with a long-sleeved white t-shirt underneath and shiny white soccer shoes, and her long, straight black hair was also shiny. In my memory, all of her was gleaming. She tried to take the dart from me, and I wouldn't give it until she told me her name. When I let go, my palm was pricked with blood. We live together now in Kat's condo with a dachshund named Murray who has hip dysplasia and a terrible personality and whose presence in our lives is my greatest regret. I know I'm lucky to have such a manageable regret. I'm lucky in a lot of ways. I'll stop there. Great, thank you. That's a, that's, that's a lovely story about the emotional toll on palliative care workers um, and Timely with with our you know new consciousness of people who are providing those frontline healthcare mm-hmm. services. I just um, before we we talk too much about the stories and we want what we want. I just want to remind people that if you have questions as we go along, please add them to the chat, and we'll try to get to some of those questions near uh, the end of today's event. Um, so please share any questions you have for Alex in the chat feature as we go. Thank you very much. Um, While reading the stories in the book, Tolstoy's infamous first line from Anna Karenina popped into my head a couple of times. Um, Whatever that means, I don't know. But we all know the quote, happy families are all alike. Very unhappy families, every, sorry, I, I messed it up. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Um, not that the families in your stories could necessarily be characterized as unhappy, but there are tensions. There is a lot of negotiating of familial relationships within the stories. And I'm, I want to ask, what is it about family and family relationship that so intrigues you as a writer? Yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, Yeah, I think family relationships are endlessly uh, interesting. They're endlessly complicated. Uh, That's where a lot of stories lie is uh, in the ways in which we have to negotiate with the people we are bound to. And that's something that starts in childhood and it goes all the way through adulthood and through the rest of our lives. And it's always changing. Um, It's never static. I don't think your sense of um, where the lines of conflict are and how they relate to how you think of of yourself. So I I used to have this line that I um, shared with students, which is that um, ideally every story, every good story is a prison story (laughs) in the sense that you want to write about people who can't extricate from them. They can't extricate themselves from one another because if people can just leave, then there's no conflict. There's no tension. There's nothing that they have to sort out. A family, even families that aren't speaking, they tend to still be lingering in one another's minds. They tend to still have things that they need to sort out. So that's the kind of sticky, messy, difficult, emotional space that... um, gives rise to interesting stories. I also think that there are a lot of different ways to think about family stories in in the way that I write and the way that all of us experience families. So sometimes it's a family group that is a family of choice rather than a family of of origin. Sometimes it's a work family. I'm really interested in work families and work as a space of uh, emotional connection and collision. So some of these stories also are about um, people who come into contact with each other that way and what what it means to them. But I think there's never any easy solutions when people are involved in a kind of contested terrain of a family. And that's what I like. I don't like when there's like a clear sort of uh, hero and villain or a clear antagonist and protagonist. I like it when everybody is kind of the protagonist of their own story and they come up against somebody else who thinks of themselves as the protagonist and then whose vision uh, is going to you know, be accommodated. 
Right, right. And yeah, I, I, I certainly got that sense from your stories that, you know, the bad guy isn't, like, there isn't the bad guy. It's, it's everybody trying to negotiate what they need within the family unit. And sometimes mm-hmm. that's harmonious and sometimes that's different things. Right. Um, which I guess, if, you know, at least in my experience, is reflective of life um, and dealing with families. <laughs> um, so um, not to give too much away about any of the stories, because I really do want people to, you know, get the book and read the collection. But um, I'm going to talk now, if I may, about a few particular stories. And I'm going to start with a story called Money, Geography, Youth. Um, In this story, Vanessa has just returned home from a year doing volunteer work for an NGO in Ghana as her gap year between high school and university. When she returns home, she discovers her widowed father has become engaged to her high school best friend while she was away and is now living in the house. Um, Now, to me, that's a setup for some serious conflict, and I really, really wanted and expected Vanessa to be angry about the developments that had happened between her best friend and father while she was away. Um, How is it okay that your best friend is engaged to and sleeping with your father? Um, But one of the things that I enjoyed about this story was her sense of resignation about it, that it did not take the emotional arc that I thought, okay, yeah, this this person's going to blow. And she doesn't. Um, Instead, she resigns herself to it. I'm, you know, I'm leaving for university soon and it makes them happy, even though it makes me uncomfortable. This sense of resignation is something I picked up in a few of the stories an almost deliberate numbing ourselves to accept things outside of our control or at least a desire to, you know, not engage or, you know, keep keep the, the harmony. I wondered if you wanted to comment or discuss that as an element in your characters at all or if you're conscious of that as an element in your character. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's true that, I mean, that particular character doesn't react with explosive anger. And maybe that's my own fear of writing. I have this uh, internal um, editor that doesn't want me to write what I think of as soap opera scenes. You know, the scenes like I I always um, think about um, what's the Tom Cruise movie uh, with the line like, you can't handle the truth, you know, where people are like speechifying or um, speaking to each other in very directive, uh, emotional monologues. I just think that a lot of times um, uh, people's emotions come out sideways or um, are repressed in the moment and then come out later or things like that. So in that particular story, um, I don't myself consider the um, the character that you mentioned to be resigned. I do think she numbs herself because it's too challenging for her to express her anger. She's too completely uh, destabilized. And I think uh, a figure that often appears in my work is the is the character of the good daughter. Like, I think she's a little bit of that, someone who is um, fundamentally well-behaved and has been given no vocabulary for anger, uh, no kind of models for expressing it. Um, She is also someone whose mother has abandoned the family and she has watched her father grieve that. So her understanding of her father as vulnerable and victimized makes it additionally hard for her to express blame to him. So I think there are a lot of layers to um, to it and some, some are gendered and some have to do with, yeah, who feels like they have power in any given situation, which she feels like um, she doesn't. As you were, you know, we were talking before, Rick, about, you know, not having villains and heroes. And I think it would be very easy to write a story with the situation, the premise that I created that presents the father as just like a despicable, um, manipulative, uh, patriarchal misogynist. And uh, I was more interested in thinking about, well, what if this is a situation that is fundamentally extremely icky, but you could also enter into the point of view of each of the people involved and understand uh, in a way that is empathetic uh, how they got there and why they are where they are and um, try to create a whole universe or constellation of characters who um, are making presumably very poor decisions, but making them for emotionally intense and perhaps even valid reasons. That to me is, is a very kind of interesting space to be in. 
Right, and 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 so even the book's title, "We Want What We Want," kind of comes in there, right? You know, it may not make everybody happy, but you know, the heart wants what it wants, sort of thing. And 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 this story itself doesn't actually refer to the title of the book; it comes from a different story. But so on that on that notion of "We Want What We Want," these kind of throwaway expressions, like "It is what it is." So it goes, and we want what we want, um, that are used to resign ourselves to situations we can control, but also really mass feelings of frustration and helplessness, right? Of like, you know, and whatever, what are you going to do, right? Um, <laughs> I got the sense that these types of phrases are really intriguing and interesting to you as a writer. They kind of like sort of ping the radar every so often within the stories. Mm -hmm. And I, I wondered if there's any truth to that about, you know, these, these phrases and, and how people use them. Oh, that's so interesting. I hadn't thought about that before, but I love that you brought it up. Um, the phrase, it is what it is. I used to say that's my least favorite phrase of all time. It's just so annoying to me because it's so meaningless and it just like repeats around and around in my brain circularly. And then as I got older, I started saying it like all the time. <laughs> and it kept being like the most appropriate reaction to a lot of situations that you find yourself in. And I'm like, well, it is what it is. And uh, I I realized, God, is it, is it stupid or is it profound? I'm not sure. It might be both. And so I, I think some of that is like, um, I, I like to play a lot with irony in my work. And I think some of those phrases I often deploy as like a comic beat or as like a moment where you're like, there's no, I have no ready wisdom to offer here. I have no um, kind of simple and um deep philosophical uh, lesson to offer. Um, I just have um, the realities of life as experienced by the characters. Right. I think, I think um, every parent I know in the world uses the expression, don't sweat it, don't sweat the small <laughs> stuff, let it go, right? Like a parenthood teaches you to just like let a lot of stuff go. So I think, I think you're right. The, these are these are annoying phrases for but then you also kind of go like I understand why everybody uses them and find yourself <laughs> using them as well even though you you know oh I be, it's <laughs> sort of like that I became my mother or I became my father kind of thing when you suddenly start hearing yourself saying things that your mother or father said mm -hmm. um exactly Great. So I'm going to now, uh, if we can, we'll we'll talk a bit about uh, Brooks Brother Guru. It's another story in the in the book, and this story tells it tells the story of a woman who goes to find out what is going on with her cousin, who may or may not be living in a cult in upstate New York. Um, and while she is there assessing the situation, she starts to get seduced herself by the trapping of this so-called cult. Uh, a bunch of well-dressed men that live in an idyllic country property who spend their days discussing classical culture and sipping cocktails. I have to admit it looked pretty good to me as well <laughs> as a reader. Um, was that part of the fun or challenge of writing this story, making a cult look like an attractive and plausible option to readers? Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, um... I, it was loosely, very loosely based on um, uh, a news article that I, I had read, um, and it, it wasn't about a cult, but it was about a person who was, um, I'll just say, like a predator, and the tools of his predation included presenting uh, a vision of what it meant to be a deeply cultured person. And that created a seductive environment for um, the people that he was sort of drawing into his orbit. So I kind of took that concept and I moved it into the idea of, of a cult. And I, I liked the idea of, you know, we think of, or we may think of cults as involving people wearing robes or living in an ashram or something. I'm not sure what people's visions of cults are. But uh, this was one that I thought, you know, could be really particular and, and specific and, and of my own creation. And the story is also, I think, in a way about a longing for a kind of life that doesn't exist anymore in the sense that the main character is someone who is living an almost completely um, online life. So she, uh, she lives by herself. And she works online and uh, she interacts with this cousin, the one who who goes um, 
uh, goes into the cult, she interacts with him on Facebook. And then even her boyfriend is like, they pretty much just chat online. She listens to all of her music online. So when he disappears and she goes to find him, she's also leaving this online dis- um Uh, existence behind and going almost back in time to experience the world of the cult. And that to me seemed like an interesting form of fantasy and one that I think many of us talk about or think about a lot. Like what would it be like to live in a world where, you know, you know, even know that Facebook ever existed. And I think that's part of the allure for her is that they seem to be in this kind of almost 19th century uh, environment. And um, it's also not tenable. It's not sustainable. And there's, you know, it turns out to be like a deeply fishy situation. But um, there are themes throughout the collection about the ways in which social media both connects and isolates us. And that's part of what's behind the cult experience in this story as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. On on the surface of things, it's a very sexy cult. It's it's, you know, (laughs) the aesthetics of it are uh, make it very attractive. Um, One of the 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 themes that I sort of picked up on is is that. Uh, most of us have struggled with the desire for an escape hatch from the disappointments and challenges of work and adult life. Um, Life is hard sometimes, and any respite from it, especially if it's easy, is very attractive. A theme, I think, in the stories is, is the pressing down of adult obligations and how we try to manage our fight or flight response in reaction to those obligations and responsibilities. Would you agree with that or or is that saying more about me or can you <laughs> see that in in the stories you know these 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 characters that are doing the best that they can with some fairly hefty adult obligations and they feel that weight Yeah that's really interesting I I hadn't articulated it to myself that way but I can see where you are coming from with that I think a a big theme in my work tends to be a kind of um, a dyad or a doubling between a straight-laced person, somebody who follows the rules and holds down a steady job and uh, does what um, they're generally supposed to do, and then their relationship with a more spectacular or wild or, um, in some cases, poorly behaved person. And um, the straight-laced person feels attracted to uh, this vision of an alternate life or to that person, um, all the while knowing that that wouldn't perhaps necessarily be the right um, the right vision for them. So uh, like the cousin who goes to the cult, I think um, if, if for a while it seems attractive, but she wouldn't, I think, ultimately be be happy if, if she stayed there. And then, you know, the first um, story in the collection is about a lifelong friendship between two women. And one of them you know, is a lawyer and uh, raises a family and uh, has a kind of reg- regular suburban life. And then her uh, friend that she made in in their 20s uh, becomes a kind of fringy uh, new age person who thinks that she's allergic to all electricity and so goes off and lives in, in the woods and only eats like mushroom and bee pollen. And there's a way in which that seems... Um, that seems strange to the main character, but also kind of alluring or understandable because it is actually very hard to, as you say, uphold the responsibilities of of regular life. So this kind of sense of like roads not taken or what would it be to um, do something uh, really, really out of, you know, breaking out of the given categories of existence, I think it's always an interesting question. And I think the the characters in this collection in particular are sort of interested in uh, how other people reflect back to them the choices that they themselves have made or not made. Right. The uh, the allure of coming home from work one day and saying, let's just sell the house and go travel for three years and see what happens, right? right? Um, the allure of the dark side for well-behaved <laughs> adults. Um, before I, I go on to the next story, I'm going to go to uh, Alicia's question in the chat, which says, thank you for a moving reading. I really enjoyed the sideways lens through which I get to know your characters. In terms of craft, how do you assess the line between a detail or story that adds depth versus one that creates a distraction? Mm. Um. 
That's a great question. And uh, for me, that's something that I'm particularly attentive to in the revision process. So when I write the first draft of a story, I often allow myself uh, sort of not to think about things having symbolic weight. I think that if you do that, you can lend you can wind up with writing that feels a bit mechanical or uh, heavy handed. Uh, so I'll often just try to seek out details by imagining a scene, by thinking about what would, you know, really work and, you know, what, what does it look like, sound like, feel like really embracing um, the sensory. And then once I've written the first draft of the story, I'll take a step back and think about of those details, which were the ones that seemed to naturally recur which are touch points that seem to have some kind of emotional charge to them, which seem to be appropriate to um, the um, what turned out to be the theme uh, of the story or the journey that the characters are on. And then which ones don't wind up fitting that. Do I have, you know, a volcano going, I don't know, I've never written a story that had a volcano in it, but if I did, you know, maybe that's not appropriate because it's not a story about eruptions. It's a story about suppression. So I'm going to take out the volcano and keep some other form of weather that does feel appropriate to, um, to the world of the story. So I really go through after the fact, and I think about um, images as an image system an ecology of image, if, if you will, like the, the weather of a given season as opposed to one particular moment of the day and think about using images and details in that way so that they work together as a kind of web and don't stick out in an extraneous way. I hope that makes sense. Thank you, made sense to me. Um, hopefully it did to her as well. Um, so the last story I kind of want to talk in, oh, there we go, she's confirmed it. <laughs> um, that I want to talk about is, is the universal particular um, in which a man invites his young orphaned relative to come and live with them without really consulting his wife first. Um, so every, every woman in the rooms just went like, yeah. Uh, the man and the young relative have a strong rapport, but the wife and the, the orphaned girl who comes to live with them never quite click. Um, for me, it started with everyone trying to be very grown up and mature about the situation and adapting to their new domestic circumstances, trying to push down their true feelings, um, keeping those internal, um, while except the husband who seems somewhat oblivious in the story to what the women in the household are thinking and feeling. But as the story progresses, we see that it's not sustainable. Despite a desire to be our better selves and manage our feelings, our emotions get the better of us and win out in the end. And I, I love the dichotomy that explored in that, the story of fighting to be generous and accepting and understanding the orphan situation and trying to, you know, we got to help her because we're the only family versus I've had enough of this and it needs to end right now. Um, um, I think, I think, again, we're seeing, uh, to me, I'm now like, now that I think of this question, I'm the, there's the theme of like the good daughter, the good wife trying to be that and ignoring the anger and frustration or trying to push down that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know if there's a question in there, but, uh, <laughs> I, I really enjoyed that part of the stories, the dichotomy of, of, um, our better character versus our, our emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thanks for mentioning that. So this story is actually, it's a, sort of an homage and a retelling of a story by um, a British writer uh, named Elizabeth Taylor. She has the misfortune of having the same name as the actress Elizabeth Taylor. And actually the, the biography of her is called something like not that Elizabeth Taylor. It's, it's terrible. But she's a wonderful writer. I mean, she wrote many, many novels and short stories. She's fantastic. And I, I feel like she's sort of criminally underread. So if you're looking for a new, um, a new writer to discover, Elizabeth Taylor, her works are um, all available in uh, those um, New York Review of Books editions. And so um, the novella, actually, that this story is written in response to is called Hester Lily. And it's a, you know, based on basically the same uh, premise where a young orphan comes to uh, comes to live with her cousin's family. The cousin is the husband. And um, the people in the household are completely inhospitable. And one thing that Elizabeth Taylor really excels in is she just delves into these really brutally unsympathetic female characters. She also has a novel called Angel that I really recommend that has a spectacular 
spectacularly unlikable female protagonist. And I, when I was reading her work, I found this so kind of liberating. There's so much discussion about likability of characters, especially female characters. And when you talk to people like in book clubs, they're always like, I didn't like the character. I've had people say it to me about my characters. I didn't like her. And it's like this pressure to make sure your characters are likable or readers will turn away. And Elizabeth Taylor just goes into the absolute opposite direction. So in Hester Lilly, the wife is just, I mean, she's terrible to this poor orphaned girl and uh, just uh, undercuts her and makes in the most British like, um, uh, you know, stiff upper lip kind of way, it's all very kind of subtextual, just makes it like a deeply, deeply inhospitable um, atmosphere. So uh, that was kind of the starting point for for this story, um, which uh, has a has a similarly kind of unsympathetic female character. She's not at all nurturing. You know, this poor um, teenager comes to um, to stay with them, and instead of like making her feel at home, she is like threatened by her and annoyed at her husband and. Um, just sort of like deeply unhappy and angry. And as you say, not expressing it in a direct way. Um, but for me, as with the, the father in that other story who takes up with a, a much younger uh, woman, it was interesting to think about like, okay, I could demonize this character or I could kind of uh, venture deep into her mindset and think about what it's like for her. And, and then the story is told in like multiple points of view, which uh, I really enjoy because we get her point of view, we get the orphan's point of view, and then we get also the husband's point of view. As you point out, he's sort of a just like a completely oblivious guy who thinks that he is morally upright, but is really just creating a lot of kind of mess and chaos in his in his personal life. So it's a real kind of clashing of, of worldviews. And uh, that to me was very fun to write because each of them, as I said at the beginning, like each of them is like the hero of their own story and they don't like the other person's story. Thank you. Yeah, I I didn't find her dislikable. I thought, you know, she was, I felt her anger was entitled. <laughs> I would be angry in her circumstances as well. Um, and her, her, when, yeah, I'll leave it at that. People can read the story. Um, I just want to remind people, if you have a question for Alex, please put it in the chat. Um, and if anyone does, well, we wait and see. Um, let's talk about metaphors and similes for a, for a moment. Um, there are some really good examples of both these figures of speech in your, in your book and in your work. In the opening story, The Point of No Return, you have the character um, in that story describing her husband in this way. Sam was stable and good for her, absorbing whatever she threw at him, the tofu of husbands, but it didn't help. I love that. The tofu of husbands, I knew from those few words exactly what type of guy he is and the nature of their marriage. And so I like for two weeks now, I'm going to now describe everything as the tofu of something. Thanks. So thank you for that. I have a new little saying. <laughs> Um, but I wondered, how much do you work on the use of similes and metaphors in your writing? And is it something you consciously think about or not? Or is, is, or is it part of the rewriting process for you? Um, just talking about that, because you're really good at it. No, oh, thank you. That's nice of you to say. I don't know how much I think about it consciously or how much I, I strive for it, except that kind of similar to Alicia's questions about uh, images, I try to um, think about metaphors. Like when I revise, I try to think about metaphors that are suitable to the overall themes of the story. And some, sometimes if I'm getting carried away when I'm writing, I'll like really kind of overdo it. And I've got like 17 metaphors in, in one paragraph and they're really competing for the right, the reader's attention. So if I've kind of over, over cluttered, uh, the story, then I will try to strip it back. And in, in the case of that line that you mentioned, like the tofu of husbands, uh, I, I have to admit, like it, it made it made me chuckle a little bit when I was writing it, which is always like fun. Like, oh, I'm, that's kind of funny, cracking myself up. But then it also winds up kind of setting up a little bit the um, strange diet that the other character is on by the end of the story. So it's not just there to be a joke or to be at the husband's expense. It's also kind of related to themes and images that are kind of germane overall to to the story. But I think what I really enjoy about that kind of figurative language is the way that it 
yokes together disparate elements. Uh, that's a that's a big pleasure that we get from from reading uh, poetry, for example, and seeing one thing put together with another thing in a way that is unexpected, right? The strange but familiar um, occupying the same space is super um, enjoyable to your brain, I think, and uh, makes you look at the world in a different way. And in a larger sense, I think that's what good stories do. Um, a writer that I um, read when I was younger, who I uh, really admire, is Catherine Ann Porter. She's an American writer and she always talked about uh, the way that she began a short story was through the yoking together of disparate elements. So if she had one thing, like let's say she was going to write a story about a relationship between a brother and a sister, she couldn't just start with that. She needed to yoke it together with some completely unlikely other thing, like, I don't know, uh, a circus or a grave or something completely different. And then once she put those two disparate elements together in the same space, she had enough friction to move forward with a story. That is very um, kind of resonant with me and the way that I write. And on the sentence by sentence level, I think that friction is also interesting to me. So tofu and husband, I think are funny because uh, it makes you picture like a big, like a uh, white block of a person, <laughs> but it's uh, it's both unexpected and also you can understand what what it means. So the um, the disjunction creates a, an interesting effect in your mind. At least I hope that it does. It, it certainly does for me, and it's I'm I'm sure it's part of the challenge and the reward and enjoyment of wordcraft, right? For the writer sometimes to do to to do that kind of thing. So I see there's a question in the chat from Kate, and her question is: Can you discuss your revision v revision process? Uh, do you leave them for a time, any particular process? How do you know they're done? Yeah, I um, often say to students that the most underappreciated tool of revision is time. I think it's uh, it's so helpful to set a story aside and come back to it six months later, a year later, if you can do that. You just see things so much more clearly, things that you were too close to before. And it's so much easier to be uh, dispassionate about it, right? Um, it's one of the hardest things to, to learn. Uh, I had the experience of like when I was a graduate student, I went through, through an MFA program and I sat in, you know, workshops, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and people would make comments. And there was one woman in particular who drove me insane. She would just really like kind of a bossy know-it-all. And I would always be like, oh, Martha, ugh, why is she always saying these things? Ugh. She just really got under my skin. And then like five years later, you know, I went back and looked at my notes uh, from some of those classes. And I was like, damn it, Martha was right. She was right about everything. Martha! And the reason that she was so annoying to me is that on some level, I knew it. I just wasn't ready to accept it yet. So uh, absolutely, I try to set things uh, aside. I am also a big um, believer in uh, taking little bits of the task of revision at a time. So I might do one uh, kind of uh, swath of revision that's just for structure. Right. So does the story begin in the right place? Does it end in the right place? Does it cover the right amount of time? What's the pacing like? Those kinds of considerations only. And then a completely separate day, a keep completely separate moment of revision that would be based on character. So looking at each individual character in a story, where do they start? Where do they end up? Does each of them get a moment? Does, do any of them feel stereotypical or flat? Etc., and then uh, another one for theme or image or setting. So just kind of making it a little bit more manageable for myself, because otherwise you can read a story and think, well, something's not right, but I can't isolate what it is. So by breaking it down, I think it makes it a little bit easier to do an investigation of your own work and find the places where uh, it could be elevated a little bit more. Thank you. Um, yeah, Martha, huh? The ones that get under <laughs> your skin and it. Turns out they were right. She was right. <laughs> That's annoying. Um, there is an epigraph in the book, and I'm always intrigued by epigraphs in books because I'm always curious why the author would choose that epigraph. So in, in, in uh, We Want What We Want, there's an epigraph by the American poet Bridget uh, Pajean Kelly from her poem Dead Doe. And it is, child, we are done in the most remarkable ways. Um, what is it about that particular quote, poem, or poet that you felt resonated with the stories? 
Yeah. So, uh, Bridget uh, Pagin Kelly, she's a, a phenomenal poet. I really recommend her her work. Um, she's she came from a Catholic background, so she's quite a um, spiritual poet in a lot of ways. Um, and this poem, uh, Dead Doe, is it does have a lot of religious imagery in it, which is not particularly a concern of, of my work. But I love the line, child, we are done for in the most remarkable ways. Because when I was reading over the entirety of the collection, I felt that a lot of the stories were about people confronting the ends of things. Uh, sometimes it was death. But sometimes it was uh, the death of a relationship or a uh, feeling of uh, the kind of death of a soul or death of a kind of moment in time when things come to an end. And finding that that moment was illuminating for them, that it was teaching them something about what they wanted from life or didn't want. So to me, that's the tension that's implicit in her line. We are done for, like we are all gonna die in the most remarkable way. This is where we find meaning. This is where we decide what our lives are about. So my hope was to kind of write back to that line and that there would be some element of that tension of, of ends and beginnings or ends and meaning uh, in, in the stories play, played out in a lot of different kind of um, situations and, and ways. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I'm looking at the time and we're pretty much out of time, but I see if you're okay with it, Jenny has a question in the chat and I can ask it and then, you know, we we'll can wrap things up. Are you good with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Jenny asks, do you, do you give your stories to people to read and give feedback or do you send it straight to your editor? Um, I'll just uh, say fairly briefly that with stories, I, um, almost all of the stories in this book have been published in literary magazines. So they all received editorial feedback from the editors in those magazines, sometimes more, sometimes less, but it's always a, a really great opportunity to have uh, somebody else's eyes on your work. And then when I put the story together as a collection, then the book as a whole, I um, show to my agent, who's a really good reader, and then the editor, the book editor who looked at it as a whole collection. Okay, so with apologies to Avis, I'm gonna wrap it up. Um, we want what we want, and I'll put it up on camera here, um, is coming out July 27th. I highly recommend adding this book to your summer reading list. It is available for order at the Village Bookshop in Bayfield, or if you live in Huron County, you can borrow it from the Huron County Library. Uh, a quick thank you to our sponsors, Township of North Huron, County of Huron, Ontario Arts Council, uh, Dr. Marie Gear, Royal Homes, Capital Power, plus all of the business logos that you see on your screen right now. Um, a special thank you to Faux Pop Media for their assistance in delivering the virtual edition of the festival this year. Congratulations, Alex, on a great collection of short stories and thanks and much gratitude for your time and participation in today's event. Um, and I want to thank everyone on this year's organizing committee, which is their names are there on the screen. And finally, thank you to everyone who attended the event this year. I invite you to be part of the 2022 Alice Monroe Festival of the Short Story. It will be our 20th anniversary next year. And that is the first weekend in June. We usually always do our event on the first week of June. And again, much thanks to Alex Olin. And please uh, check out her book when it comes out in July. It's a great read. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. I really appreciate it.